Well, good evening, everyone. Um, as Amanda said, I'm Rob Woolsey. I'm a member of the Guild of Battlefield Guides, and tonight we're going to be talking about the very first gas attack at Eat. So this gas attack took place officially in the Second Battle of Eat. There was a total of five actually in the war. This battle takes place in 1915 and is a hugely significant um, battle a, in terms of what happens in the war, but as well it was the first time Canada actually fought an action, and it's the first time that a um, non-European power stood up to the Germans and, and was able to hold um, hold the line quite significantly. So it was it's, it's one of my favorite battles to talk about, and we're actually going to be talking about a location that I have walked the ground many times and I'm totally enthralled with to this day. MFS Europe is not affiliated with me directly or anything I do or any of the co companies I'm talking about are locations. And they're just place, people that I recommend and things that I use. And they don't sponsor or does not sponsor or endorse any of these things. So just as, as a disclaimer to you all. So we're talking about the country of Belgium. Um, we're going to talk about some recommended preparations, travel advisories, some helpful hints, uh, some really must try foods and places in, uh, in Ypres. Um, some transportation. We're going to talk about the Saint Julien Canadian Memorial, which is a very significant memorial. We're going to talk about a small unit memorial, the 15th Battalion Memorial, uh, a relatively modern memorial that was put up in the last few years called the Kitchener's Wood Memorial. Uh, and we'll talk about the PPCLI Memorial because while it was part of the battle, um, it wasn't tied to the Canadians. While the PPCLI are Canadian, they weren't in the same area. It's an interesting story. And then we're talking about John McRae's dressing station, because that is where the poem in Flanders Field was written. And then we're going to talk about some of the commemoration locations for this battle. So Belgium is a town in West Flanders. Or sorry, in is Belgium. We're going to be talking about West Flanders. Its population is about 35,000 and they speak Flemish. There are two airports that service this area, predominantly Brussels, the main airport, and then Brussels Charleroi, which is rather convenient. So this is uh, Ypres, an ancient medieval cloth town. Um, it's been known and tied to England for a very, very long time because of the cloth trade. Uh, the town, um, many of the town's fortifications date back to as far as 1385, and you can still see most of them, along with a whole series of fortifications made by the famous French engineer Vauban in the eight, uh, 1680s, which is, uh, you can actually walk on those fortifications today. They're called the ramparts. Uh, it's the 28th most expensive country in the world to live in, and it's kind of average for Europe for costs. Um, Ypres was the only Belgian city not captured by the Germans in the Great War, and it was the main focus of British military operations for most of the war, with five battles being fought between 1914 and 1918. And this is, this is the reason why uh, Great Britain and then their empire went to war, including Canada, was because of the German invasion of Belgium, and no other real reason. So. The weather is aggressively mild. It's got warm summers, a cool spring and fall, and very wet and cold winters. Um, rain jackets are a very important thing when you're visiting Ypres. Uh, the best time to travel is really April until about November. Uh, as I said, bring a raincoat. Um, everything is outside, and so you want to dress for the weather and, 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 and have good shoes. It's really quite important to have good footwear. It can get quite muddy. Uh, have travel insurance. Uh, you never know what's going to go wrong. First World War battlefields are generally um, more dangerous than, say, Second World War battlefields for a lot of interesting reasons we're going to talk in a bit. Um, all of the battlefields, memorials, and museums are kids and family friendly. They have some really great ones. The Cloth Hall has a great one. Passchendaele um, Memorial Museum in the town of uh, Zonabeek is great. And the Hooge Crater Museum, all really great for kids and families. It's They're really fun. And there are no city passes for Eper, by the way. I have looked into that. So uh, always check the Government of Canada website for safety and security concerns. Belgium is a relatively safe country. There is petty crime, of course, but nothing too serious. And of course, in this day and age, we have to check the uh, COVID country requirements. Right now, there's no problem if you're coming from inside of the EU. Um, that's the same for visas. If you're coming in from the EU, there's no, there's no visa requirement, um, which makes life convenient. It's, it's the same from Canada. If you're flying in from Canada for less than 90 days, you do not need a visa. Um, as I said, petty crime, lock up your valuables. You don't want to be a victim of that. There is a hospital in Ypres, which is rather convenient. Um, the emergency number is 112, just like the rest of Europe. And the closest embassy and consulate is in the city of Brussels. It's the only one in the country. 
and Brussels is about an hour and a half away, as I recall. So here's some helpful tints, your tips. You're going to be out in the community when you're on the battlefields. So remember, this is where people live and, and they make their livelihood. There's lots of farm fields where you're going to be visiting these memorials. So you really need to respect the space. Uh, the farmers and the locals get very upset when tourists go tromping through the fields when they've just planted their crops in the spring or just before the harvest is out. Uh, it's usually safe to go um, see and collect some things potentially um, uh, in, in the late fall. But again, there are bunkers and things that they're on people's properties and you need to respect that. Uh, the bunker in this picture is at Tynecott. So if you want to see a World War I German bunker, um, Tynecott is a good place to see it without actually interfering with anybody's uh, personal property. The other really important thing to be aware of is the amount of war remains is epically large. Uh, they come to the surface predominantly in the spring and the fall with the plowing and putting into the fields and in the harvest. You need to be very aware of the fact that they exist and not to touch or kick them. They're incredibly unstable. One third of every artillery round fired before 1917 failed to explode. And they figure it will take about 700 years to clear the battlefield of all the unexploded ordnance. So, and that's just artillery shells. That's before grenades and rifle ammunition. And, and they are there. Some of it's just stuff that's fallen. Some of it's stuff that was meant to explode and didn't explode. If you see it, just walk away from it. It's not worth your life. Some of it looks really cool, but it is exceptionally dangerous. Because uh, this also includes gas shells, which uh, is becoming more and more of a problem for, for the communities. So when you're in Ypres, the food and the drink is absolutely worth trying. So my favorite beer in town is the Wipers Times Ale. My favorite is the blonde of the two. There's also a, 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 a brunette. Uh, it's fabulous. It's light, easy drinking. You can get it at most places. Uh, Belgium is known for its beer, but this one is a particularly favorite. It's actually named for the newspaper that the British soldiers produced in Ypres during the war. So Ypres is the kind of um, Flemish name. Um, it's also known as Ypres with a Y, P-R-E-S, which is the French spelling. And if you're a British, they we pronounce it Wipers. And um, that's why it's got the name Wipers Times. And it was the name of the newspaper. It's, it's a lovely, wonderful beer. So I recommend a couple of places. Um, first one, of course, is De Trompe. It's a fabulous restaurant. Great food. I had the beef tartare there. Lovely service. Great ambiance. They've got a great patio. Uh, it's right by the Cloth Hall. It's just, it's lovely. Uh, and if you've got family and kids, Eper's Burger is really quite good. Good service. Fast and easy. I have teenagers. They don't like nice food. They like hamburgers. That's where we go. So, and it's really easy. Again, right on the Grand Place, not far from the Menon Gate and not far from um, the, uh, the Cloth Hall. So some places to stay. My personal preference is the e, uh, Novotel Ypres Centrum. Um, it's a little bit of a poppy theme. You have to really like poppies, uh, but it's great service, includes breakfast. There's parking nearby. It's a fabulous hotel. Uh, two others that I've used in the past, New Regina Hotel is lovely, but it's smaller. And the Albion Hotel I'm going to be using in the future um, because I couldn't get into the Ypres Centrum. But there are lots of other places you can stay around. And some of them are B&Bs in some of the communities. And there are other hotels. But if you want to stay close to the center of Ypres itself, those are the three that I would recommend. So there are taxis and Uber uh, in uh, in in Ypres. Uh, so tour guides, this is something I always recommend to people. So you can use the Guild of uh, Battlefield Guides, their website, um, to find a guide. There's some absolutely incredible guides that I've gotten to know and work with from there that that specialize in Ypres and in the battles around, uh, around the town. Uh, there's some also local guide companies you can find. There's uh, the Grenadier Bookshop has some recommendations of battlefield guides as well. It's right down by the Men and Gate. Or you can talk to me through Woolsey's War Walks, and I'm another great option. I spend a lot of time at Ypres, and it's one of my uh, passions is the, all the battles in and around the town. When you're getting around or driving, if you're renting a car, have your international driver's license. It's not an absolute must, but it makes renting a car much easier in Belgium. So this is, now to get to the good stuff, this is the map of Ypres, and this is the map of the Second Battle of Ypres. So the Canadian division arrived in France in February of 1915, landing at St. Nazaire, France in the middle of the month, and began what was to be a month of intensive training and preparation mixed in with various British divisions. In the middle of April 1915, the Canadian division moved into the front line 
just northeast of the town of Ypres. They occupied about 4,000 yards of trenches from the Ypres Pulpacal Road running southeast towards the village of Gravenstoffel. Um, and so you can see it, it's the blue line uh, at the top right hand side of the screen. And you can see the town of Gravenstoffel there. Running from west to east was the 13th Battalion. So they were the very east side touching the French troops of the Royal Highlanders, the 13th Battalion, Royal Highlanders of Canada, under the command of a man named Frederick Loomis. Beside them was the 15th Battalion, which is the 48th Highlanders. Beside them was the 8th Winnipeg Rifles, of, commanded by a British officer named Louis Lipset. And the battalion on the very right-hand side, uh, closest to Gravenstoffel itself, was the 5th Western Cavalry, now the North Saskatchewan Regiment um, uh, Battalion of the 2nd Brigade. On the 22nd of April, the, it was a bright and warm spring day, described as glorious, in fact, by most reports. And it was a quiet day for the men of the 13th Battalion, who were in the line just north of the hamlet of Kirsalir. The Germans had been shelling the Ypres salient since the 17th of April, but mostly into the rear areas, bridges, roads, and other aspects in the rear, which to the Canadians meant that their day was quiet, according to their official reports. The trench lines here were not deep or as extensive as they would later become, as this new style of trench warfare was still in its infancy. The terrain also prevented extensive digging. Most of the front line was what's called a breastwork, an above ground wall essentially used to protect the soldiers. There was no back, so to speak, and the line was mostly straight, which meant there was no zigzagging, which is a feature of later trenches. But the 13th Battalion had good wire in front of them, and they had seven of the Colt machine guns with them in the front line. To the immediate right was the first, sorry, toward the, to its immediate left was the 1st Algerian Division, who held from the Ypres Pelpokel Road, running west. The 13th Battalion had three companies in the line under their command of their deputy commanding officer, a Major E.C. E. Noseworthy, who was in a reserve position just behind the front lines. The remaining company and one machine gun team were back in St. Julien with the commanding officer. So Major Noseworthy was a stockbroker and high risks uh, investor from Montreal and from a fairly well-off family. Uh, in fact, the 13th Battalion in that front line of the 27 officers that participated in this battle, 14 were millionaires in 1914, and there was one that was actually a billionaire in 1914, and they were all from Montreal. And interestingly enough, all bilingual. At 3 p.m. on the 22nd of April, the Germans opened up a terrible bombardment on the French and Canadian lines and the support lines of the 13th Battalion. This lasted for almost two hours, and at 5 p.m. that afternoon, the Germans opened up gas valves on gas cylinders they'd hidden in their frontline trenches and unleashed 168 tons of chlorine gas, the first ever poison gas attack in modern warfare. At first, the first Canadians knew what was happening was the fury of fire coming from their left from the French lines as a greenish yellow cloud coming down from roughly the village of Langemark uh, and moved towards the French. The Canadians, further away from the initial fighting, noted a green hue around the sun, but they didn't know why. When the French stopped firing as the green cloud enveloped them, and before long, the terrified survivors began streaming to the rear. Major Noseworthy was along the road and had lost all communication with the forward front line. But he and one of his captains, a man named Guy Melford Drummond, who was the billionaire I talked about earlier, who was happened to be bilingual, both of them, began to rally the French survivors on their troops. At the front line, the three company commanders had little idea what was happening to the left of them. One of them, Major McQuaig, moved to the French trenches beside him to see what was going on, only to discover the 1st Battalion Le Trilaleur of the French Algerian Division holding off German infantry, and he quickly placed some of his men in behind the French to support them. The cloud that had hit the French had masses of German infantry moving in behind it. This began a long and terrible fight for the 13th Battalion, now who had to bend into the form of an L to secure their flank. Major Noseworthy and Captain Drummond both fell, along with all of the men with them, except for five. Those five survived the battle and, in fact, withdrew forward because it was safer to go forward to the front line than it was to fall back, and reported to Major McQuaig. Major McQuaig took over the defense, rallying more French troops 
who were falling through their positions and fought all night long. While this was happening, the 13th Brigade, the 3rd Brigade of the 1st Canadian Division ordered a counterattack against the Germans to help reform the line. And so the 10th Battalion from Calgary under Lieutenant Colonel Boyle from the 2nd Brigade and the 16th Canadian Scottish Battalion moved up from Ypres, ordered to go into the attack without any reconnaissance and did so using an out-of-date line abreast formation. And they made it over halfway before they hit an obstacle, a hedge with wire, and then had to run the last 400 yards or so with bayonet fixed into the German trenches. Lieutenant Colonel Boyle was mortally wounded as the attack um, charged, and the attackers lost over half their strength as they fought well into the woods, but had to fall back to the southern, southern edge of the woods by dawn, and essentially fell under the control of the surviving commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Leckie. At dawn, with no help arriving, everyone began to fall back to where the memorial is today, only to have two companies, the last, the first, first company of the 13th Battalion and a company from the 1st Battalion, the Buffs, arrive to reinforce them, and they moved forward again to reoccupy the line without the Germans noticing. The 23rd of April was another day of vicious fighting by the 13th Battalion, in an attempt to hold the line. They had to give up the road and other ground, but basically the line pretty much held. The 24th day, the 24th of April, was the beginning of the end for the Canadian division. It had sent all of its battalions into the line all over, plugging gaps and reinforcing in little bits and pieces. It had been costly so far, as two commanding officers had been killed, and the better part of four battalions had been mauled. The 24th dawned with the second gas attack in history, this time aimed at the Canadians of the 2nd Brigade, and it hit the junction between the 15th Battalion and the 8th Battalion. The 8th Battalion held on, well supported and well led, while the 15th Battalion broke and were overrun, suffering the most casualties of any Canadian unit in any single action of this war. They withdrew to a location called Locality C on Gravenstoffel Ridge, forcing the 13th to also retire but with huge losses. Two of its companies were completely overrun. The 8th and 5th Battalion, helped by the 7th Battalion, were able to hold on to their line and retire in good order. The 3rd Brigade commander, a man named Brigadier Richard Turner, Victoria Cross, recipient from the South African War, ordered a huge retreat back to an unprepared defensive line against the orders of his Canadian Division Commander, General Alderson, making the situation much worse for everyone. But thankfully, the men holding the town of St. Julien fought until they too were overrun, captured, or destroyed, which gave time for British reinforcements to come up and reinforce, reinforce and reform the line. There had been much confusion and misunderstandings from the commanders of the brigades, which led to lives being lost and ground being given up needlessly. But the Canadian infantry had fought and had held the Germans back. The Canadian infantry were eventually pulled off the line on the 25th of April, moving into reserve, and, but their artillery had to rem remain in place and fight until the 8th of May. Most people don't realize when we talk about the first gas attack, they think they talk about this one little incident. It was a series of gas attacks, and the actual battle went on until the 25th of May. And the Canadians only fought in the, really the opening phases. So it's an important battle because it had two major gas attacks. So the first thing we talked about, uh, we're going to talk about is the Saint-Julien Memorial also known as the Brooding Soldier, um, and is one, the first of the memorials to Canada from the First World War. It stands at a place called Vancouver Corner, and that's often what it's called, especially by British guides. They will call it Vancouver Quarter. And that's what it's named on all the maps at the time, uh, all the contemporary maps. Um, just north of it, along that road, there's a, uh, a, a culvert, and that's actually where Major Noseworthy and Captain uh, Drummond, in fact, fought and fell. Uh, and it's only a couple hundred yards north of that was the very front line. Uh, that road is the exact same road that was fought over in 1915. And just south of the memorial is where uh, the first of the two actions that Lance Corporal Frederick Fisher of the 13th Battalion performed to be awarded the first Victoria Cross to a Canadian in the war. Uh, his first action was just south of the memorial. Uh, he helped save the guns of 10th Field Battery on the evening of the 22nd of April as they were firing over open sites at advancing German infantry that was trying to get around the 13th Battalion. And on the 23rd, he moved his machine gun into action on the road to stop the Germans because uh, they had been were getting around the Canadians. He ended up getting cut down as he was bringing his gun into action. Now, to the east of this memorial, 
uh, it's a, it forms an X, as you saw on the map. Uh, that's where the Canadians, the 13th Battalion, fell back to on the 24th of April when the second gas attack struck. So this memorial is unique. It is a one-off memorial. It is the only one like it. Every other memorial after this to a battlefield other than Vimy is your traditional granite, uh, Quebec granite block. Uh, it is very well lit. It's got a beautiful set of gardens. And it is one of the few memorials where you are actually almost smack dab in the middle of the action for the Canadians. It's it's one of my favorite memorials to go to. Um, I did my presentation for my first assignment, which was you had to present a battle. And I did this battle. And lo and behold, I had the best guide on Ypres, the expert of experts sitting front row, super excited to hear my presentation because that was intimidating. So, but it's not the only manual. This is the Canadian memorial, but there's a couple of other ones that are really unique and interesting. Not far from that, just off Gravenstoffel Ridge is the memorial to the 15th Battalion. So this is a series put up by the 48th Highlanders of Canada in the recent years. It's located where the 15th Battalion fell back to, locality C, um, and they suffered, as I said, more casualties than anybody else in any battle in this war. This is where they suffered just absolutely horrific casualties. Um, they took the second gas attack. Their artillery wasn't able to support them. Um, the German came right behind the gas and just overran them completely. But one of the reasons that they didn't do super well was their commanding officer um, was reported not to be on the front line. And according to many reports, he was actually drunk and hiding out in a dugout in the, in the rear area. Uh, he was a politician and a member of parliament at the time. Um, but their de deputy commanding officer, uh, Major Marshall, who later fell about a month later, led the battalion right through the worst of it. Um, there's a series of these. There's one um, uh, to the 40th Highlanders uh, not far from here where they fought at uh, Mount Sorrel. So it's a great little memorial at a place called Locality C. Um, and it's just on the side of the road. And it, it's, it's a worthwhile memorial to see if you're just following this battle. The next one is the Kitchener's Wood Memorial. So. Kitchener's Wood doesn't exist anymore. Um, as you can see in the photo on the bottom right, that's exactly what Kitchener's Wood looks like today. It's a farm field. Uh, but there's now a memorial to this battle, and it's a, a fairly modern memorial. Um, it was a huge fight. Um, it's a controversial battle because it was ordered in a panic by the brigade commander, uh, Brigadier General Turner. He didn't have a good fight. He made a series of blunders and tactical errors and proved that while he was personally very brave, he was not a great um, battlefield commander and his brigade major which was at the equivalent to a chief of staff was a man named major garnet hughes who just happened to be the son of the minister of militia and defense sam hughes um, so he got his job because of his dad essentially um, and he rushed forward gave them no chance to do any reconnaissance or any preparation and then worst of all he ordered an out-of-date formation that hadn't been used since 1815 in the War of 1812, um, hadn't been used since then in Canada. Uh, so Lieutenant Colonel uh, Russell Boyle, who's the commander of the 10th Battalion, who arrived first, he didn't object, nor did he even deal with a known uh, German position that he'd been brought to his attention at a place called Oblong Farm. So the disaster was also kind of his fault as well. Um, when the CO of the 16th Battalion arrived with his unit, uh, after he had no chance to influence any of the decisions. And so he basically followed up in support. But after the attack went in and was consolidating, Leckie called for reinforcements. He got horses up to recover some artillery pieces that they were saving out of the woods. But when he received nothing, all while taking fire from Marlog Farm, he also ordered the men back south and held on to that location with the survivors for more than 24 hours. This battle is pretty epic. It cost 259 men killed, 406 wounded, and 129 missing out of a total of 1,500 attackers. It was a brutal fight. And it was really, um, when you're taking 75% casualties, it's, it's just, it was an epic fight. This is the type of struggle. It was almost titanic in nature. Now, this memorial is different than every other memorial in that the PPCLI, being a privately raised unit, while they fought at Second Eep, they were not in the second. They were not in the Canadian division. They, in fact, had gone over to France before the Canadian division. Uh, and they were part of a regular British division, the Twenty Seventh, and they actually beat the Canadians. They were the first Canadians to actually go into action. 
So uh, in the second phase of the battle, or sorry, at the Battle of Gavinstoffel Ridge, which is essentially the first gas attack's official name, although according to the official historians, nobody knows why, because the battles didn't take place on the ridge. Um, they were actually in the line east uh, near Fresenberg and were kind of not involved in the battle at all. But the second uh, phase of the Battle of Eat, Second Battle of Eat, began on the 8th of May when the Germans moved three infantry corps forward opposite the British 27th and 28th divisions and began a bombardment of Fresenberg Ridge, followed by three attacks against the shattered 83rd Brigade of the 28th division, and but was checked by the 80th Brigade of the 27th division. And while one of the other brigades had to be pushed back, opening a two mile wide gap, the Germans tried to punch through this gap, but were halted by the PPCLI, who were fighting in the reserve in a vicious fight that reduced the battalion from 700 men to 150 by the end of it. And they were completely and utterly exhausted. What is actually also remarkable about this is that the PPCLI were equipped with British weapons and equipment. So they did not suffer the same challenges the Canadian division had with Ross rifles because they had Lee Enfields. The PPCLI, PPCLI motto, hold up the whole damn line, actually comes from this battle. So this is a unit memorial put up, um, of course, just after the war. Uh, there was a very famous painting uh, made by uh, W.B. Woolen of the PPCLI in their battle. Uh, you'll notice in the painting that none of the men are wearing helmets because at the time of the battle, there were no helmets on either side. Nobody wore helmets. So when you saw the first memorial at Saint-Julien, you see a soldier with a helmet. It's actually wrong because in 1915, no Canadians had helmets. John McRae's Bunkers. This is a place I love to take people. It, it was, it's, a, it's a fabulous place, the fact that it still exists. This is what it looked like in the war at one point. This is, I believe, 1917. Um, John McRae was a medical officer at the time of the battle with the 1st Canadian Field Artillery Brigade. He was a major, and during the battle, he worked out of an 8 by 8 foot dugout or bunker, and it was made just into the dike along the Yser Canal, just north of the town of Ypres. This site, along with several others close by, where ambulance and dressing station cemeteries were located throughout the war. By 1917, it, the location had become a concreted bunker and expanded to be able to handle the number of casualties. The cemetery south of the dressing station is called Essex Farm Cemetery and was used from April of 1915 until August of 1917. Also in this location, there is a memorial to the 49th West Riding Division who would use the dressing station and began plot one of the cemetery in 1915. John McRae's friend, Lieutenant Alexis Helmer, who was serving with the 2nd Battery of the 1st Canadian Field Brigade, was killed in action on the 2nd of May near Saint-Julien when he was struck by a shell. After presiding over the funeral of his friend, he composed the poem in Flanders Fields, as he noted how the poppies quickly grew in and around the fresh graves. It is stated that McRae composed it while looking out over Helmer's grave. Legend also has it that McRae was unsatisfied with his work and threw it away, but either his sergeant major, a man named Cyril Allison, or another man, Edward Morrison, saved it and submitted it later that year. John McRae died in 1918, but not from wounds or in battle, but of illness. He died of pneumonia at Willemur, France, and is commemorated there. Uh, Alexis Helmer's remains in war grave were lost in the war. With Ypres being on the front line, many cemeteries were shattered and destroyed by shellfire, and so now he's commemorated on the Menin Gate Memorial. And this is what the bunkers look like today. What's neat is you can actually go into the bunker. Uh, there's a plaque. You can kind of see it there that shows which was the, believed to be the John McRae dugout bunker location. Um, a few years ago, this was completely flooded, overrun, run down. It's been very nicely renovated. And of course, you'll notice there's a memorial register so you can sign that you've been there. And there's the history of John McRae and his story and a brass uh, copy of his poem in the same script that he wrote it. So commemorating the fallen. So Ypres was on the front line of the war for the entire war with five different battles of Ypres by name occurring. Some having secondary names by which they're known today. Battle of Passchendaele is one of them. Battle of Gravenstoffel Ridge is another. The first gas attack was the opening actions of the second battle of Ypres which lasted from 22 April till the 15th of May and caused about 100,000 casualties, which is a lot. Many of the fallen are commemorated on the Menin Gate. 
the memorial to the missing of the Ypres sailing who fell before the 15th of August 1917. There are 54,000 names, including 6,700 Canadians, on this gate. Notable, there are Frederick Fisher, Victoria Cross recipient, Frederick Hall, Victoria Cross recipient, uh, who both won Victoria Crosses, um, sorry, were rewarded, awarded Victoria Crosses for their actions in the Second Battle of Ypres, and Lieutenant Colonel Birchall, the commanding officer of the 4th Battalion. He's actually a British Army officer, but he fell attacking west of Kitchener's Wood in a supporting attack. Um, but he's commemorated there with his battalion because his body was lost as well. Many of the fallen from the Second Battle of Ypres are actually on this gate because, of course, they were lost. Menin Gate's about to go or is undergoing some renovation right now. So if you're going to Menin Gate, be aware that some, ask, some parts of the gate are not going to be accessible for the next 20 months as they're doing some renovations and repairs to the gate. Tynecott Cemetery and Memorial holds many of the fallen from this battle. It is the largest cemetery in the Commonwealth War Graves Commission holdings and almost has, has almost 12,000 headstones within it, including those of Major E.C. Noseworthy and Captain G.M. Drummond, who were discovered after the war and identified only because Captain Guy Drummond was so tall. There are about 33,000 British names who fell after the 15th of August 1917 on the walls of the cemetery, um, as these names could not fit on the Menin Gate. In total, there's uh, 907 Canadians commemorated in this cemetery. Uh, and they're from predominantly uh, Second Battle of Ypres and then the Battle of Passchendaele. So Val, I always get to pronounce this wrong, Val Mertiginga Military Cemetery is was started by the French in 1914 and taken over by the Commonwealth forces in April of 1915. It was used by units and field ambulances until June of 1917, when it could no longer be extant, expanded. Uh, and that was because of a railway siding used to support the front lines. Of the 11, 1,175 burials in the cemetery, 1,166 are known, which is actually pretty rare and uncommon for a First World War cemetery. There are 54 Canadians here as well. Uh, and Popper, I'm going to pronounce this one badly as well, because I always do, Pepper, Pepper Inga Old Military Cemetery also remain, contains Canadians that fell in the battle, uh, 46 in total, uh, including that of Lieutenant Colonel Russell Boyle of the 10th Battalion. So these are cemeteries that are far enough back that when the men were wounded, they would be hauled back here. So these are wounded that fell or wounded that died of their wounds uh, as they fell back or as they were evacuated, sorry. So there are over 100 British Commonwealth um, cemeteries in the Ypres salient, along with one German, two French, and one Belgian cemetery. The first gas attack in 1915 changed the war entirely, as gas became more and more commonplace, and then more and more deadly. The first gas attack by chlorine was quickly replaced by phosgene, and then diphosgene, and then finally the horrid mustard gas. Canada while fighting and then taking the second poison gas attacks in history, became one of the most prolific users of gas, in fact, with the very first heavy use of gas uh, being the buildup and then into the attack of Vimy Ridge, followed by Hill 70, and continued throughout the war. Uh, General Arthur Curry, who, uh, Lieutenant General Arthur Curry, who later commanded the Canadian Corps, uh, hated mines, but would gas the Germans at every opportunity. Every battle plan from the time he was um, even as the divisional commander of the 1st Canadian Division around Vimy, uh, when he became the corps commander, every battle he planned, he would gas the Germans relentlessly. And he also had his artillerymen trained. So as they advanced and they captured German guns and they couldn't bring forward their own guns, they would be able to turn German artillery and specifically German mustard gas on the Germans. It's actually a pretty, pretty shocking fact. Um, this was not considered a true victory for Canada uh, on this battlefield, as the Canadian division lost ground, suffered 6,000 casualties out of 18,000 men. Of that, more men were taken prisoner in this battle than at Hong Kong a generation later, and exposed some of the flaws and weaknesses of the Canadians. The Ross rifle and Colt machine guns they were issued did not perform well. The main issue, uh, main cause of the problems was actually the ammunition, uh, and Canadian leadership was found um, wanting. Uh, Brigadier General Turner's performance was actually very poor in the battle. The division commander didn't have great control um, and, and, and didn't necessarily trust his Canadian subordinates. He didn't use one of his Canadian brigadiers, uh, General Mercer. 
General Arthur Curry's first time in action was this battle as well. And he didn't, while he performed okay, he didn't perform super well. And so overall, the British were kind of not super impressed with the Canadians as much as the publicity said they were going to do very well and, and how awesome they'd done. But the Canadian soldiers were exceptionally well led at the battalion level and actually stopped the Germans before they got, achieved their true breakthrough and essentially helped carry the beginning of this battle. And that is the first gas attack. It was a total of three days of hard fighting for the Canadians. <laughs> 